Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. And I'm glad to be here on this wonderful stage. Um, and today I want to talk about um, basically the topics which came up in my area of work in the last couple of years. In my experience, I had um, there um, working for media companies and um, therefore I prepared this topic. Who am I? I've done my uh, master's in IT security and forensics and I worked um, for different companies mainly in the um, media or broadcasting um, field in the last couple of years in the SOC or blue team area. Um, I also wrote a book about Wi-Fi security and currently I'm working for SRF which is the public Swiss radio and television. And today, um, I'm going a little bit throughout the cybersecurity framework and trying to um, give you some topics um, mapping to the different fields there. So we are talking about the situation we have here in Switzerland. We are also doing a little bit of threat modeling or how to threat model. Um, and I will have some like best practice defense mechanisms for you prepared and then we are going to the forensics part. So how is the situation here in Switzerland? This is the um, Freedom of Press Index. It is released by Reporters Without Borders every year and we are currently in ninth place out of 180 countries so it definitely could be worse. Um, yeah, um, but it doesn't mean everything is perfect. We are still colored yellow instead of green. So, um, yeah, we also have room for improvement there. And, um, I mean, journalists don't n only work here in Switzerland. So therefore we have uh, definitely a lot of different threats. Um, we all know about a lot of different government spyware, which is professionally made by companies to supply governments, secret service police for fighting crime. Um, but we all know that this is not always the case and it got sold to um, states in if, um, like more autocratic regimes and it has several cases, there are several cases where um, not only like um, human rights advocates and activists have been attacked, but also journalists. And this is a thing broadly spread around the world. Um, and the probably most famous software in this area is Pegasus. This is um, a spyware, government spyware made by the Israeli company NSO Group. And that is known for being able to still circumvent all the security measures from even up to date iPhone and Android systems. Um, and this one is broadly used around the world. Um, and we know since, um, a couple of years back that this is also a case of the, that they are using it here in Europe. Um, we know of 16 countries here in Europe where Pegasus is currently in use and when back then when this article was released Switzerland was not on the list but that changed quite uh, some years ago in 2021 we had some whistleblower from probably the secret service talking about it confirming that they are using Pegasus and back in uh, spring this year there was another whistleblower um, confirming it and that they are still using it today. So what are the different kinds of surveillance we have here in Switzerland? On the one hand we have mass surveillance. This is all the um, broad surveillance measurements which can be done without any judicial decision and um, which is used to surveil basically everybody. So we have the Kabelaufklärung, which could be translated with like cable reconnaissance probably. And this is a fairly new law which was made to um, intercept and um, yeah, eavesdrop on all outgoing to connections, all the data traffic going out of Switzerland because um, the 
argumentation was um, no, we will not try to spy on Swiss people. As if two Swiss people are communicating with each other, we don't want to spy on that. But everything which is going outside of the country, this is definitely an area for interest, of interest for us, and therefore they made this law. The problem about it is, if you think about it, um, they are allowed to um, reconnaissance or they're allowed to eavesdrop on every connection going outside. And if two Swiss uh, citizens are writing an email between each other using Google Mail, this will definitely go through some servers outside of Switzerland, as well as nearly every other communication or like every app uses some cloud backend, which is probably not hosted in Switzerland, or most of the websites are not hosted here. So even Swiss citizens will probably get the majority of their um, data traffic um, being eavesdropped on. Then they have, we have the Vorratsdatenspeicherung. Um, the data retention or data retention law, which is a law dating back to 2002 and it was made for um, like reconnaissance, for law enforcement, for uh, phone calls, SMS, MMS, um, and it basically um, enforces that every ISP um, has to save all the metadata they get um, of all calls, SMS, MMS, for a period of six months. Um, that means they are getting um, like a phone number, um, in the May uh, date and time of the connection, but um, through the uh, through triangulation of um, how far and how good the connection to the nearest cell towers are, they can also um, triangulate your position. Um, later on, that was also broadened that emails are also um, falling under that law and uh, this is all being done without any judicial decision um, and it's still in place today. How about targeted surveillance here in Switzerland? Um, there are a couple of laws regarding that and to put it in a nutshell, um, there is the possibility to confiscate your phone, to confiscate your electronic devices and to go through it. Um, and also the use of a government spyware is permitted here in Switzerland, but all of this has to be uh, presented to a judge first and he will make a decision if it will be allowed in that case or not. So it will be some specific targeted surveillance. Um, and this is also the area where Pegasus would come into play. Um, thanks to the leaks we got in spring of this year, we also know the price tag which the Swiss Wicked Service has to pay for um, targeting um, or for eavesdropping on one device with Pegasus and I think it's about 3,000 Swiss francs per month per device and um, this kind of enforces them to not use it as a measurement of mass surveillance just out of economic reasons. So we can be sure that they are indeed only using that um, when they have a definite suspicion of somebody. Um, yeah, let's start with threat modeling. I don't want um, want to recommend like security measurements which are that restrictive that you have to, um, like, that your daily working um, experience will be quite bad with your devices. And I don't have to recommend to everybody that you do the Snowden move and cover yourself with a blanket every time you type in a password. So therefore, you should do your own threat model to see on which kind of uh, risk level you are. And the most basic thing would be basically a uh, risk analysis, um, having a basic risk matrix here. You have your um, x-axis with your uh, country you're operating in or you're doing your research in. And you're having your uh, y-axis with the risk level of the topic you're researching. 
And that also pretty much correlates because uh, not every topic would be the same risk level in every country. Like, for example, if you're researching some, some scandal in the car industry, it would be a high risk topic, for example, in Germany, where there's a big lobby and a lot of money involved. But here in Switzerland, it wouldn't be that much big of a thing because they don't produce um, a lot of cars here. Um, and if you're doing the same thing in banking, it probably would be a high-risk topic in Germany too, but it would be way more risky here in Switzerland. Um, and how can you identify the risk level of a country? That is quite easy if you just use the Freedom of Press Index from Reporters Without Borders. And they are releasing it each May um, of every year, and they are ranking 180 different countries, so all the countries they can get like uh, sensible uh, or usable data, data from um, and they are doing it with five different factors. They have the political indicator, the economic, the legislative, the socio-cultural and a security indicator and they're basically taking the average out of those five and giving you a global score and ranking you um, towards all the other 179 uh, countries. And as you can see, here in um, Switzerland, we are doing quite good, and all the northern, central, and western European countries are doing quite well, while, um, yeah, we have quite the lack of a lot of eastern European countries and basically the rest of the world. Um, so you can get a feeling of your risk level just using that. If you want to go a little bit deeper, you can do some more advanced threat modeling using a framework like Stride. There are different frameworks available, but this is quite an easy one to use. It is just um, categorizing your threats into six categories, spoofing, tempering, repudiation, which is that you can claim that you didn't do something which you did, um, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And um, you can categorize your threats using these categories and then mapping mitigations to each on one of them. So how would that work? You basically paint yourself a diagram of your um, commonly used IT infrastructure, you you work with in your daily life as a journalist um, um, and you like you have your entities, you have your processes, you are maybe um, doing some trust boundaries and then when you have your like uh, context diagram, you use it and uh, define threats or brainstorm threats for each of those entities and processes you have. Um, and then you identify mit possible mitigations for each of those threats. Do some... Uh oh <laughs> Do we have some AC here, maybe? <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it is a process which you... Do we have to do something? Maybe someone blows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I will improvise. Okay, let's do it. Um, have, do you have to do everything by yourself and manually? No, there are some tools available and you could just um, go to the website of Reporters Without Borders and they have an online tool, like an online wizard guiding you through of it. Um, which would be an easy and quick method. And if you want to do it a little bit more in depth, you can use the OVAS Threat Dragon, which is a tool mostly used for threat uh, modeling in bigger enterprise environments or even business threats. Um, but you can definitely use it if you are a journalist. So let's step on before the beamer will burst up in flames. Um, how do you defend? I mean, it is definitely, this is a topic which is um, definitely um, 
something related to your threat modeling, right? But over the years, there are some general tips and tricks or some best practices which uh, came into play, which I try to uh, collect here. So I don't want to bore you with the basics, like do your updates and use a VPN if you are on public Wi-Fi, and obviously 2FA everything, etc. cetera. Um, so I want to move on quite quickly. Also, like encrypt everything, use Lux for Linux and Veracrypt for Windows and SSDs. And if you have some cloud storage in place, um, which is definitely uh, promising you very well being very well encrypted, don't trust it. Use Cryptomator as an open source end-to-end um, -end encryption to additionally encrypt it. But also keep in mind um, about your target audience. If you're doing IT security stuff for journalists, don't expect everybody to be super tech savvy. So sometimes you have to go with the second best option um, if someone doesn't want to bother with these tools. And uh, you just have to give them like a crypto USB stick, uh, which has a keypad on it um, to easily encrypt and decrypt it. There are no open source, open hardware um, tools like that I know of at least. So I wouldn't recommend doing it unless um, you have to. But yeah, sometimes it's just um, business need. Also, thankfully, since the security measurements of smartphones got quite better in the last couple of years, um, persistent malware gets more rare and there is quite a lot of more or spyware which will get deleted by a reboot as funny as it sounds so reboot your phone regularly also maybe don't use like your business smartphone or iPhone your employer gives you but um, okay but use an alternative operating system instead I think we are taking off here, okay. And if you have an iPhone, you can also activate the lockdown mode. And the lockdown mode is um, a mode made by Apple, which will quite restrict you in your daily life. So it's not recommended for everybody. But if you are a high risk target or going to a high risk research project, you can activate that and it will basically um, deactivate all iMessage attachments besides pictures. It will um, it won't allow any MDM on your device. It will deactivate just-in-time compilation in Safari. It will turn off 2G and um, it will also delete all kind of metadata of pictures when you are sharing them. Another topic would be file sanitization. Um, not all the, all the files you get are free of malware, but, but also not free of the risk of doxing your source or your whistleblower. And I will come back to that later. Also, there is the Google Advanced Protection Program. If your employer forces you to use Google, there is this mode which you can activate and it will basically um, do the best practice of security options, um, activate them for you, like enforcing 2FA and doing deeper Gmail scans and uh, restrict the, third, the use of third-party tools to connect to Google services. If that is not enough for you, I have some more tips and tricks. And if you are really keen on staying anonymous and your smartphone to stay anonymous, just switching your SIM card regularly probably won't help. So there is a method that you just deactivating all outgoing um, like interfaces like 4G, 5G, Bluetooth, etc., and you use a mobile 5G modem instead because there are some modems with, where it is possible to change your IMEI. IMEI is the identifier for the network interface, IMSI for your SIM card. Um, so have a set of anonymous SIM cards you're switching regularly 
and then have an, a modem with a changeable IMA and only connect to that modem if you want to use your in uh, internet. Also try to check your hotel room for bugs and cameras which can be quite tricky. Um, there is a method of like a stroboscope flashlight, um, turn off your light in the hotel room and try to see if you can see some lens glare in your room because camera lenses will reflect the light. Um, but yeah, bugs are quite hard to detect. You would basically have to uh, like disassemble all your power plugs and everything, so good luck for that. But what you definitely can do is unplug all your IoT devices you have in your hotel room. Unplug your smart TV, unplug your probably your IP um, phone you have in your room, and yeah, if there's some like Alexa or smart light bulb, um, probably also deactivate that. Yeah, so just to make a quick note, we realize we've lost the projector. We're really sorry about this. Um, with We are recording and streaming, so hopefully the content will be viewable at a later point, but I'd suggest at this point, if you just keep going, try to iterate verbally as much as you can. I mean, we we've can got a hold screen. Up the screen. Yeah, I can try and maybe put it here, but yeah, if you keep going, we'll, we're okay. trying to fix it, so sorry about that, guys. Yeah. Now we uh, lost the screen. <laughs> Um, yeah, I will just improvise. So the next um, method would be a dead man switch. You want, um, you probably want to have uh, some measurement if you get caught or you are feeling that you will soon be caught um, to delete all your stuff. So um, there is an app called Ripple for Android, and there is also um, there is also the possibility to just go to a colleague. And um, give them your logins, so he c and tell him I will call or contact you every five days. And in the event I don't contact you um, for five days straight, then log into my accounts and uh, remote wipe everything, remote wipe the phone, etc. You can also do it uh, with a technical measurement. Um, there, you could like get a phone number, and if you call that number, you can even do it out of prison. Um, it will activate a remote wiping mechanism which will um, yeah, remote wipe your cloud drive and your iPhone and everything you have set up. I mean, I don't have to... No, right. no please please do keep going because for the stream they will see it. So yeah. keep going. Thank you. Okay. Um, now you have to imagine a picture of a screw with some paint on it. And this is the, the warranty paint you may know if you open your laptop and you see like a drop of paint on your screws and they want, they try to tell you if you unscrew that your warranty will be voided. In a country with good consumer protection laws it won't be the case, but they are still trying to do that. But you can use this kind of paint. You can order it on Amazon or eBay or whatever for a couple of bucks and um, you can paint it on your screws yourself because there probably will be some time frame where you leave your devices unattended, right? You will leave your laptop in your hotel room or you will um, you want, will go over a border where the border guards have the legal possibility to search your stuff out of your eyesight. So your electronic devices might be, ah, thank you very much, might be, um, might be compromised there. So to see if somebody tempered with your device, mark all your screws, maybe even the um, yeah everything which can be opened basically, so you will know when somebody fucked with it. Um, you okay? Next topic will is what kind of smartphone do I recommend? Um, our smartphone operating system. There is this thing called Grafino S. And I mean, you have the, always the problem if you are using a custom ROM, does it really improve security? And the answer is not, not always. Um, it will probably leave you with an unlocked bootloader. Um, it will um, leave you without verified boot, etc. And um, this will not always improve your security, but there are alternative ROMs or custom ROMs which are focusing exactly on that. And um, Grafino S 
is doing an open source project. It is made by some NGO, um, with a big community behind it, um, donation based, and they are having, um, privacy and security focused smartphone operating system made for especially such purposes. Um, and it has no direct connection. It's like completely degoogled. And it uses some different security measurements like uh, the hardware security module. It has a long update life cycle um, and has a lockable bootloader and verified boot, which most of the custom rooms don't. It's fully open source and freeware and you can get it easily by their website. That's another point. If you tell a journalist, yeah, flash your smartphone with Linux OS or some other custom ROM, uh, you have to somehow find a vulnerability to unlock your bootloader and then flash custom recovery and then uh, put the uh, alternative OS via ADB on your phone and they will go crazy. So Graphene OS, on the other hand, has an easy web installer and uh, therefore is and therefore can be done by a non-tech savvy journalist himself. <laughs> okay, and it... I'm sorry guys. We are all professionals. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I can't see my it. own screens. It's okay. As we have a coffee break into the next thing, we can still overlap and give you the time you need. That's cool. But uh, yeah, just bear with us, guys. Apologies, of course, for that. Uh, yeah, we're doing the best we can as quickly as we can. Maybe whilst we're waiting, I don't know, if anyone, does anyone have any questions already at this point? We could maybe already ask a few things. If anyone does, please raise your hand and we can uh, keep engaged whilst we wait here. Uh, I have two questions for you. If you hear. Yes. Yes. So the first one, you mentioned that the uh, companies in Switzerland have to retain emails for a certain amount of time. Thus, uh, for example, Proton Mail has uh, have to actually retain the emails for that period of six months. Is, yeah, are they legally bound to do that? Yeah, there are exceptions for small companies, and as far as I know, Proton Mail is still small enough to. Um, be under that exception and they also fought it legally with their lawyers and as of now they don't have to do it as far as I know. Also um, the Vorratsdatenspeicherung data retention law is only regarding metadata so they can't, uh, even if they would fall under that law, they don't have to publish the content of uh, emails. Thanks. And the second question um you mentioned that the location is being collected by the triangulation of the phones. Uh, are you saying that the telecom companies are required to provide this information at real time to the intelligence services, or is it uh, more like based on the metadata of the previously collected, uh, as, like SMS messages, uh, as you said before, and then uh, somehow made assumptions based on that? Um, I'm not sure if I got everything. It was a little bit uh, So the quiet, question is basically whether the uh, 
telecom companies are required to uh, provide the information on the uh, basically location of the yes. phones real time or is it just based on the uh, subpoena uh, access to the uh, SMS messages logs, something like that? Um, to be frank, I don't know. I don't know if there's like an APA in place if the Secret Service can just get all the information in real time. Um, but I think that they will get it quite quickly if they want to. But that is, I am not sure if that is publicly known, if there's like a time delay between message sent and delivered to state secret service or police. I'm not sure about that. Great. We will still have time for questions more at the end. We have a small screen. Thank you, tech guys. We've got a show love where love is due. Thank you very much. So we will continue. Sorry for the guys at the back. I hope you brought binoculars. Otherwise, again, this is being recorded and streamed so we can catch up. But uh, yeah, we hope we can continue to finish now. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I basically talked about my recommendation about the smartphone operating system. And um, yeah, be very aware which apps you put on it. Um, since every app basically could be a way of um, like data loss. So probably use open source apps from the F-Droid store and do some due diligence. So look into it if there's some public bug tracing on GitHub of those app, of, of this app, if it gets updated regularly, if there's a community behind it developing it. Um, and yeah, be aware that like the less apps you install on it, the less um, possible vulnerabilities or um, there are. Um, also, there is the possibility to activate Google Play services if you want to, and that totally depends on your threat model and your business needs. So um, it is a sandbox Google Play services, which you probably can get kind of anonymously running with an anonymous Google account. Um, but yeah, this is for you to decide if you really need it or not. Um, another thing which your journalist probably needs in a daily basis is a whistleblowing platform. How can a potential source contact you securely and without exposing himself or doxing himself? There is an industry standard, it's called SecureDrop, and it is an open source solution for whistleblower submissions. Um, it was developed by firstly Aaron Schwartz and then the Freedom of Press Foundation, and it's used by a lot of media companies worldwide, like uh, the NDR, Norddeutsche Rundfunk, The Guardian, the Deutsche Zeitung, BBC, but also SRF. It's open source, it's freeware, it had several security audits uh, done, um, Cure53 did one back in the days, and there's also a bug bounty program in place, so it's not the worst thing to have. Yeah, that would be great if it would be bigger, but let's try. So um, this is your whistleblower, your source, who wants to drop some data. He will connect via Tor services. Um, here is an internet gateway, and you could make it a normal um, router or some 4G, 5G modem. And behind that, you have a monitoring server and application server. And the monitoring server is doing uh, what the name says. It will send you an email if something breaks. And the application server is another Ubuntu server running the segmented Tor hidden services, and which is the interface to connect for your journalist, uh, for your for your sources, but also for your journalist. Because the journalist will also connect via uh, Tor um, to download the dropped documents. And these documents are still encrypted, and you have to transport them to an air-gapped device where the encryption keys are stored um, to prevent them from ever being leaked. Um, decrypt those things, do your um, like uh, file sanitization, some like virus, virus scan, etc. And then 
you can put it on another USB stick and trans import it to your enterprise infrastructure, infrastructure to work with it. File sanitization. Um, you don't want to drop your files you get from your sources immediately on your cloud drive or on, on your uh, file system storage. You want to defend against those three different threats, uh, malware, metadata leakage, and document tracking. Um, we have some self-built uh, measurements in place, which are unfortunately not yet like publicly released or open source, so I'll just show you the basic um, scheme of it. Um, we do it that way that we have a laptop, and you put in your USB drive, it will do a basic malware scan and then start either a virtual machine or some um, some Docker container and do the sanitization. And you get your clean files, put them on another USB drive, and then you can work with it. Um, and the software we are using for it, um, I mean for the malware scan, you can use your malware scanner of choice. Um, Clamor for would be an open source possibility. And for metadata leakage, you just use uh, EXIF tools. Um, and then for more sanitization, there are different tools for different uh, file types. And they are also defending against hidden tracking mechanisms. There is a story about the TTIP leaks from uh, 2018, where a whistleblower gave Greenpeace the secret TTIP um, contract documents, which were like top secret and only AU parliament, um, people could look into it. And this document got leaked. And um, before they published it, they found like strange spelling mistakes in it, very obvious ones, um, strange dots, etc. And they did some analysis and this were probably tracking mechanisms that every um, EU Congressman got a um, dedicated copy which had different tracking patterns. So in case of leakage of the document, you can trace back who leaked it. And to prevent the uh, source getting leaked, they have written off the whole 1000 page um, bureaucratic language document by hand to be really sure. You can do that if you have um, the manpower, but if you, that's your daily business and um, you're getting a lot of documents regularly, probably build some Docker container with those tools to do it automatically for you. So you have done all of these different techniques, tips and tricks, and you still think you might have gotten infected. What can you do about it? Especially since government spyware is not easily recognizable by a normal virus engine, right? Um, so there is, the, this is the forensics part, and there is the mobile verification toolkit, which is a toolkit released by the Amnesty International Security Lab, and it was developed a couple of years back for detecting Pegasus spyware. And since then, it said been uh, continued to develop and now it can also detect other spyware because um, all the, the indicators of compromise for Pegasus um, are similar of other spyware too, so now you can broadly use it for recognize um, different spywares. It works very well for iPhones and it works not so well for Android phones because of the lack of uh, log data they can get from it. Besides having a rooted Android device, um, then it's basically on the same level, but it would um, it would be a security risk to run around with a rooted Android device. So what do you have to do? Um, you basically create your iPhones backup, iPhone backup via iTunes. You uh, install the MVT toolkit, or you install Python, libUSB, the MVT toolkit. And then you have MVT minus iOS for uh, your iOS commands and minus Android for your Android devices. So you do 
decrypt the backup and then you could uh, analyze it to check minus backup or you can download um, pre-made indicators of compromise from the Amnesty uh, GitHub, GitHub account or any other source of IOCs and um, let them do the work a little bit for you. But it's still checking through a lot of different IOCs yourself. It's still a manual process, so it can't give you like a check mark, virus free or spyware free uh, or uh, infection detected. It's a um, lot of manual work. On Android, it can only det um, will only go through SMS and APKs, um, but you can use ADB. Then it has also access to dump uh, to dumpsys. Um, or you have a rooted Android device, then it has a lot of lag data available and can basically the same as for iPhone. Um, so maybe you can root your device just for the analysis, but be aware that it also could uh, delete some IOCs if you're doing that. To sum it up, do your threat model. Um, do it for each of your scenarios or do it when you have a big change in your infrastructure so you have the measurements and mitigations in place which are best for you. Um, also, if you're working with journalists, don't assume everybody is super tech savvy. So do solutions which are applicable for a broader audience and which are uh, easy to use. Um, and last of all, there are a lot of great open source projects for this kind of software. And there is a big community developing it. So um, go out and look for those projects and um, you will probably can avoid a lot of uh, big tech companies and paid services. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, thank you, and I hope you could see at least a little bit, even with the small screen. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you, Rico, once more. Thank you so much for the patience and bearing with us as we sorted these issues. Uh, what's great is, yeah, we're still uh, on time, and we have still some time for additional questions, if anyone has some still, so please raise your hand if you do. And then next will be the coffee break for roughly half an hour before the final talks of the day and then the closing ceremony. So, yeah, before we get there, let's have some final questions. Thank you for this interesting talk. Um, so you were mainly focusing on Android and, and iOS, and you were also speaking about uh, tech savviness. So do you have experience regarding laptops OS, for example, something like Tail OS, which is not Windows? And this is the first thing. And the second thing, do you also have experience with, for example, storage on camera devices, which should be encrypted or something like this? Is yeah. this, how, how do you, how do you do this with your journalists? Okay. Yeah, first of all, there are operating systems, which, I mean, there's this Cubes OS, which is an operating system doing sandboxing different environments. So you have like your work environment, private environment, or something for your project, and they are virtualized and separated and therefore quite secure. We tried it with some journalists and uh, it was quite heavy to make it work. Um, because, um, yeah, you need to be probably uh, good in Linux and it is quite a bit buggy still. So we came back to just let them use, um, Windows or the Linux distribution of choice. Um, I haven't found yet an alternative operating system, which is super easy to use and bug free and, uh, will provide all the security, uh, measurements, which I would, which I would wish for, unfortunately. And to your second question, um, yeah, it's unfortunately unencrypted on a normal Sony um, DSLR. It will be unencrypted, but you can transfer it to your SSD as soon as you can and um, encrypt the SSD with Lux or Veracrypt and then safely delete the SSD card by overwriting the whole content. Just formatting won't be enough, 
but you can override it like one or two times. Um, use CCleaner or a tool of choice um, to delete not only the index of the files, but the whole uh, storage. Great. Another question. Awesome. One sec. How do you prevent OPSEC fails? <laughs> Good question. Um, you have always the danger of um, people using shadow IT if stuff gets too complicated, right? And um, if your security mitigations, meaning you have to give them very techy, very nerdy stuff, that will increase the possibility of them just doing it on their own way and circumventing your security measurements and therefore uh, exposing maybe their sources or themselves. So yeah, try to um, give them training on the devices, try to keep them easily usable for non-tech savvy people and um, spread security awareness. Do your security awareness campaigns, um, maybe some online training, maybe some um, in-person training before they are going on a more risky country for the research project. Great. Um, thanks for the talk. And one question for me. Um, how do you detect if you have been targeted by surveillance? Because you mentioned the physical question, but on digital level, do you have an a way to do that, an idea, or to just guess? Okay, I mean, if you cannot detect it on a technical level, what you can do in many countries, at least uh, in the EU, you can, um, it's called uh, Auskunftsersuchen. Um, there are data protection laws in place, which gives you the right to ask about um, things which are stored about you. And in some cases, you can even ask law enforcement what they have stored about you. But it will only obviously work in uh, GDPR-compliant countries. And um, if you have been targeted by some secret service of an autocratic state, chances are low that they are telling it, right? So probably get a good forensics expert uh, and let him try to recover some IOCs on your devices um, to find out if you have been targeted or not. Great. We still have time for one or two more, if we have any here. As a follow-up, um, do you have some OPSEC fail stories to share? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't think of any which I can or should tell you right now. <laughs> That's okay. But we can move on to the next one. Yeah. I'll sort that out. But we, what we had, we had an incident where somebody indeed got Pegasus on his device and um, that was not due to negligence of the journalist, but it was a zero-click, zero-day exploit from Pegasus back in 2019 where you could, uh, where the first... Um, exploit was an iMessage, a malicious iMessage, and you couldn't do anything against it. Um, you get like, uh, you, you see the message for like half a second and then it will disappear and your device is compromised um, as an uh, initial attack vector. So this was not an OPSEC fail, but more like, um, yeah, you couldn't much do anything about it. Uh, you mentioned uh, Graphene OS, which I think is a great OS. Um, do you have experience with Pure OS and the Librem 5 phone? Or What's the name? Uh, Pure OS Pure on the OS. Librem 5 phone, which I, no. has uh, hardware kill switches, I think. Unfortunately not, but I did compare some uh, custom ROMs. And there is, besides Graphene OS, there is... EOS and there is um, what's it called Calix OS and both of them ranked quite well um, but not on the level Graphene OS um, was operating like they still had um, like the, the captive portal check was still made by Google or via a Google server and like the time server was still a Google server so they are like the small 
differences um, in those operating systems which led me to Graphene OS. And um, maybe the question is also which devices you have available. Since Graphene OS is unfortunately only running on Google Pixel phones, you might have to opt for another custom ROM. Um, Calyx, I think, is also supporting fair phones, and uh, I'm not sure about EOS. I think they are supporting even more devices. But Graphene OS deliberately only um, targeting Pixel phones because, ironically, Pixel phones are one of the easiest to de-Google, and you can install an alternative OS without um, a lot of like exploits and installing a custom recovery and unlocking the bootloader and leaving it unlocked. Um, and you also have, um, um, what's it called, a hardware security module, which only is in Pixel phones and I think in newer Samsung phones, but those are really hard to, to flash a new operating system on, so they are opting for Pixel phones only to have all the security measurements in place. Great, thank you. Final chance for one more, if not you. <laughs> okay. So you talked before about F-Droid. I was told by a very good friend never to use F-Droid because the signing key on the push to devices is one key for all apps. So Signal, WhatsApp, they all use the same signing key, or that was so in the past. Has that changed? Or... I'm not sure about the signing key, but I will definitely agree on not just installing the F-Droid app and letting, letting your journalist download everything he wants. Instead, do your due diligence and hand select or manually select the apps you want to install for him. Um, you could also download them via their website, but this would uh, have the challenge of updating it regularly, uh, which is something F-Droid is doing for you. So you have to decide which yeah which which uh horse to ride there yeah. great thank you very much once more rico round of applause once more thank you <laughs>